Myths of Globalization. This lecture we're going to be looking at this very amorphous thing called modernization. And over the past few lectures we have looked at the evolution of, of early kind of proto-globalization uh, through a medieval economy into theories of capitalism, socialism, and the various manifestations of these economic theories and political philosophies. And today I want to look at kind of another aspect of globalization and sort of rationality thought uh, that comes out of the Enlightenment but is absolutely part of this modern global cultural process uh, of development that is with us today you know when someone says oh well that's not politically correct well what does that mean it doesn't fall within this sort of narrative of of secularization and progress that we have that started much much earlier um, than the modern modern concept of political correctness not to say that these are the same things but that they develop out of this notion of of secularism and well, what is the idea of progress and secularism? Well, there was a notion that came out of the Enlightenment, and we'll get more into this and its principal thinkers, that the world is on an upward trajectory. That it is possible that human beings can create a utopian world. Think of you know, Karl Marx's theories. That is ultimately what he is arguing as well. Um, he is within this, this theory of enlightenment of progress, that man is not um, a a cog within the wheel of a particular deity um, but rather humankind man is is able to generate change and make the world a good and bucolic place the notion that the of progress that the world is getting better and better and that through innovation, through invention, through philosophy, education, globalization even, that we can make this world a shining city on a hill. And this comes, like I say, right out of the Enlightenment, and we're going to get to that. And interwoven within this theory of progress, and really inseparable, I think, from that, this theory of progress, is also the theory of secularization. And it comes with this baggage that over time rationality non-religious methods of behavior your ethos the things that make up and dictate how you behave morality virtue uh, non-religious ethos and um, secular governments will replace religious belief and institutions within modern societies that the world will become more secular based on ideas of science uh, and and uh, and philosophy rather than uh, and rationality rather than than uh, older religious uh, th uh, theologies and and beliefs in uh, a particular way that religion has has shaped our society and continues to shape our morals and virtues so more on that but these are the two overarching themes of this lecture and these two things come right out of the early enlightenment and we really have four key pillars uh, to this new enlightenment rationality and thinking um, first that science science is going to loom very large in this science is going to create new systems of knowledge that are different just simply different ways of thinking they're going to begin with the scientific method and ex experimentation um, and and try to, and they will uh, these thinkers will create a new systematic way of approaching knowledge, really a new epistemology, and uh, interwoven within these these new method, theories of knowledge are uh, is secularism. That the focus is not primarily upon salvation, the other world, but rather it is it is focused upon how to make this world a better place and not about how to make humankind's soul um, better and therefore to transcend this world reason or rationality 
um, that humankind can explain and improve the world in and of themselves. And that knowledge need be formed through careful observation and experiment. So, and I, I, I kind of spoke of this in my introductory remarks, but old knowledge, medieval knowledge, ancient knowledge um, held that people from long ago were much smarter and better than modern knowledge. Now, it's completely the opposite uh, within uh, Enlightenment thinking, that they, they really turn this on its head and they say, no, ancient knowledge is, is not this brilliant glowing light that comes out of the past that we cling on to that we, it teaches us how to know everything uh, the great classical thinkers like Plato and, and Socrates um, while they give good insights they are not what we need to be paying attention to rather we need to be paying attention to the here and now and new theories uh, new ways of thinking the modern philosophies that is what is the highest and best knowledge and this is is largely we still hold to this to some degree um, in our modern world at least within the academy that will oh this research is 25 or 30 years old this research is 200 years old therefore it's it's uh, borderline worthless um, whereas in the ancient world medieval world they would said oh well if you're if you're uh research isn't at least 200 years old then it's borderline worthless um so uh this this idea the theory of progress is that we will continue to build upon our knowledge and that new knowledge is better knowledge and um that we can reorient our thought towards a golden age in the future that that we can think our way we can reason our way into making a perfect society with this comes new theories of uh, religion or new religious philosophies. This is often referred to as deism. Um, what is the difference between Christianity and deism? Well, Christianity holds that there is a specific revelation from a specific God to a specific group of people. So if you're not part of this club, if you're not uh, part of the revelation of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, uh, ultimately through Jesus Christ, and that if you don't believe in the, the core doctrines of, of Christianity, embrace them and, and, uh, and behave like you have embraced them, uh, then you're doomed. And you're not part of this, this body of Christian believers, um, and, and uh, um, you're just not part of this club. Now, a deist would say, that's fine if you believe all those things. It's, it doesn't matter because there's just one overarching God who is responsible for all revealed religion. And um, this God uh, set things in motion and then stepped back. And so therefore all uh, religions are equal. And they're really, what, what brings to the fore this, this uh, theory of deism is, is almost a necessity is be, with the discovery of the new world. Um, when you find 60 million people who have no knowledge of Christianity and you believe this to be the one true religion, um, you, you struggle to, to come up with answers of why that was the case. Why, uh, why did God not reveal himself to all these other peoples? So uh, deism is one of the answers uh, to this. So therefore, um, um, God becomes a much more distant figure, removed from, from uh, the daily actions and life of man, whereas before um, God was very much a, 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 you know, an intimate companion that played an active role all the time uh, in everyone's life. Uh, and, but with the deistic philosophy, God is a very distant figure that plays very little role, if any role, um, in the actual functioning of society, but rather God is something that sets, sets uh, the basic uh, uh, tenets of the world into motion, and then humankind is responsible after that of, uh, for their own, their own uh, developing their own morals and virtues and systems uh, and, uh, and making the world a better place. 
So, along with this new religious theory, um, scholarship begins to advance after the en Enlightenment period in ways that it, uh, it hadn't before. Um, and many new um, texts were discovered. And they were brought into Europe because the world is becoming, well, more globalized. So uh, people began to read after the Reformation period, or really during the Reformation period, people began to read Greek and Hebrew. And uh, they began to, to expand their, their own thinking. And also, they began to expand their geographical footprint. And when you go exploring in the, uh, the Middle East, and when you go exploring all over the ancient world, you begin to find new texts, you find uh, new things, you find civilizations that are actually older um, than what the, 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 the Bible, the Christian sacred document, um, says about the history of the world. Uh, you discover these things through archaeology and through textual criticism. That uh, we, there's lots of manuscripts that have have been uh, have been taken and edited and edited again and edited again, um, and they didn't make their way into into this sacred text in the Bible. And there's other. Uh, competing theories in it, and, and we don't. This isn't really a class about that about Christianity, and there's good reasons why the writers of the Bible chose uh, the the text that they ultimately chose to put in it. Um, but uh, there are other stories of that are very similar to say Noah and the Ark, um, the Epic of Gilgamesh, which is eerily similar. There are other flood myths, and these are older than our oldest uh, manuscripts for the the, uh, the Old Testament or the uh, the Hebrew Bible. Um, so we have, or the the uh, the people of the post Enlightenment have to to learn to grapple with this, and they began to question the authority of this great sacred scripture, and then as time progresses even farther, right when we get into the 19th century. Um, this is taken to a whole new level where, where the, the authority of the Bible is really, really brought into question. Um, and and um, there is an attempt by some scholars to, to uh, say that Scripture is not l literal. But we have to sort of take it for what it is, and it can be more allegorical meanings and, and this kind of thing. that we have. It can't uh, necessarily be interpreted as exactly uh, a, a literal understanding of when you read something. And one of the most famous uh, uh, writers within this liberal uh, theology is, uh, is Friedrich, or Fr uh, Friedrich Schleiermacher. Um, and, uh, and he tries earnestly, and, and many liberal theologians try earnestly to bridge this gap uh, of uh, of Enlightenment rationalist theory and and also Christianity, so uh, they they always wanted to reconcile these two views: the this sort of modern rational thinking um, and the traditional Christian thinking, and they were not really totally successful. Um, but they tried very hard. Uh, to, to make these two systems come together and work together. But again, this is part of this, this sort of globalized, this new view, you know, that you can't just have this insular uh, view of a tiny corner of the world, but rather uh, this is when the world is becoming an imperial place with industrial processes and you are meeting new people and encountering new cultures, new traditions, uh, things that have questioned your long-held wisdom and, and, uh, and beliefs. Um, and, uh, and, and it's hard to, to, to grapple with these kinds of things. Um, and, but it's, it's showing that this world has become a globalized, or becoming more globalized, becoming more aware of cultures and, and, uh, and, and sophisticated intellectual traditions. And I want to return after we discuss just sort of the, the, the religious challenge of, of this through the secularization thesis and discuss the advent of what I keep referring to as rationalism. Um, René Descartes, really, the French philosopher, is the, really the founder of the school of, of rationality. And he argues that 
this sort of inner human reason, the, 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 the thinking, the epistemology of the mind, the ontology of the mind, um, your own reason is a new standard of truth. The individual, through deep introspection and rationalism, or this art of thinking, um, replaces theology as sort of the highest level of truth in philosophy. So uh, Descartes famously asked the question, how do I even know that I exist? And ultimately he comes to the conclusion, I can't really know that I exist, um, except that I am th I know that I am thinking. So in some form, I must exist, whether that be uh, I am in the matrix or manipulated by a computer or so, in some form, I do exist. John Locke is another principal thinker. Um, and his theory of knowledge is a little bit different than um, uh, Rene Descartes. Whereas Descartes kind of believed that people had uh, these innate ideas that he was a Platonist at heart. Um, John Locke is, is at heart an uh, Aristotelian thinker. And he believes everyone is born just simply a, a, a tabula rasa, that they have no ideas, no nothing. Everything that you know, understand, believe comes from experience. So therefore, education is key to making good citizens and to making the world a perfect, better place, and and he is really the the leading light for for uh, English English uh, Enlightenment thinking. Um, and he also comes up with the theory that there is a social contract theory um, that uh, that people give their rights to their rulers, and it's part of this thing that it's all we're all part of this educated world that we have to come together, we have to work together. Um, in order to make it a good and wonderful place. And this is a very globalist way of, of thinking, right? That uh, it's not just one monarch or a god that uh, makes decisions that are absolutely right, um, but rather this is something we have to work through together, that we all have to be part of this world, uh, and we have, to see, uh, we have to see these experiments through uh, uh, in order to make the world a good place. And we do that through, well, observing and thinking of creating new good and uh, good systems. So there's other thinkers here, and I don't want to get too deeply uh, into this. Um, but these are the people we usually refer to as the uh, the philosophes. And uh, among them are Voltaire, Montesquieu, and Rousseau. And um, Rousseau argues largely um, that he wants to get religion out of the realm of government. He doesn't believe that religion should play any role in, in the government, but rather it's just a, uh, it's a private matter uh, between you and God, and he, 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 uh, he was very enamored by the openness of England and the, the freedoms that they had there as he visited for the first times. And um, he he wanted to see the creation of a open society that was not stifled um, by uh, by the church. He very much, coming out of France, saw the church as an oppressive force. Uh, that you had to be a member of the church. You had to to um, you had to belong to this club if you wanted to to. Uh, uh, have success in the world, and it was it stifled creativity. Um, whereas in England, that uh, there was much more openness, that uh, the government wasn't influenced by an oppressive Catholic Church with the uh, the Pope as the monarch, uh, far far away, uh, siphoning off funds and and, uh, and stifling creativity. Uh, Montesquieu, uh, largely, um, he wanted, this, and the most famous thing. Uh, Montesquieu argues for is checks and balances. Um, he really, I mean, if, if you want to live in a, in a hippie commune in Northern California, Montesquieu is your guy. Read Montesquieu. Um, he just, he basically says, what's the best form of government? No government. 
Um, you know, just let's hang out, man. Um, but if government must exist, it needs to have a lots of checks and balances. And Thomas Jefferson borrows from Montesquieu um, in, in that he, is, uh, he puts a lot of checks on power. And uh, Rousseau is, is also one of these great philosophers. Um, and his famous line is um, that man is born free everywhere, or is born free but everywhere in chains. So that in a state of nature, humankind can be totally free, um, but he is shackled by society because you have to work in order to be able to live within a society. Um, so his argument is that uh, you need to sort of return to a uh, to a, a primitive state of living. Um, in, in small communities with very localized government. Um, get rid of all the hierarchy. Libertarianism, basically, is what Rousseau is arguing for. And um, the, the challenge to this argument might be, well, yes, if, uh, if a person is born in a state of nature, they, they may be free, but also that there is nothing then in the, that uh, prevents another stronger person from coming and, and attacking them. Thomas Hobbes will argue that, uh, well, actually, the government is necessary because it protects you from uh, the nasty, barbaric world when you live in a state of nature where everyone is in violence against each other. So what is the best form of government within this? And this is something that we will talk about ad nauseum uh, throughout this, this uh, course on globalization. What is the best form of government? So we have to really think about this. Um, so we can look at sort of a, an absolutist model. We can look at a limited monarchy where where a, a, an arbitrary ruler uh, has limits on their power, right? So they're not really an arbitrary ruler. They're just a limited monarchy um, where there's some shared powers. Um, is it uh, better for a theocracy to exist uh, that uh, simply a, cl a clerical elite might, might uh, rule over? And uh, there are examples of this. Uh, is a republic the best idea? Um, you know, where you have a, a democracy where certain parties represent your, your, uh, your interests, or is just anarchy the way to go? That we all just live within our local realm and we sort of look after our own interests and, and, uh, and manage our affairs at a very, very micro level. So I will leave you to ponder on this idea, um, and, and uh, we will discuss this later. So what is the legacy of the Enlightenment, of the scientific revolution and, and modernism, which is all part of this big package? Well, I think that they largely brought into question ancient traditions and, and, uh, and long-accepted forms of authority, such as uh, the, the sort of the, the Christian scriptures as being uh, infallible, and, uh, and literal, that they began to question how we knew what we knew. There were new ways that uh, people began to think and understand things. We began to have new ways of, of relationships, that maybe, maybe kings and governments and, and churches were not uh, absolute institutions. Maybe this was something that they acquired this power um, and did not deserve to have it. Um, and Ultimately, it, the, the world becomes bigger. The world expands during this time through industrialization, through, through imperialism, uh, through new intellectual currents. And ultimately, human beings saw their place in the world as, as different. And it became not about how I do God's will um, instead, but how do I come to grips with the world? Uh, it, the world becomes about satisfying my own individual needs and, and that I become uh, that I, I truly my own individual, that I am not part of, of some theocratic uh, framework. Uh, I am an Englishman who thinks independently. 
rather than just simply being a member of the body of Christianity. Um, so it is it is a way of becoming more individualized, and this this can't this leads to some problems, um, but it it also leads to to highly new ways of thinking. And uh, this rationality, this comes out of the Enlightenment. Uh, that it it, be, it it really takes on uh, it, a new aura of being the ultimate truth. That it it replaces theology as being the answer to all the questions in life. Uh, it, it wants to to say that humankind is capable of reasoning their way through problems that uh, that you don't you no longer have to turn to scripture you no longer have to turn to theology to answer your questions that that you as the as a, a scientist as a rational thinker can can reason through all the problems of the world and fix them and make the world ultimately uh, a better place so this is the grand theory of secularization, of rationality. Um, so, is this true? Is it? Is the? Are these uh, actual? Uh, these these enlightenment thoughts. Um, is this is this experiment that we have had? Is it? Um, is it correct? Is it the right way to view the world within a new globalized network? So, I would I would just raise a few key challenges to the secularization thesis. And that is that uh, this was confined uh, to a group of largely elitist thinkers who uh, were were who rebuffed uh, theological uh, reasoning and and long held uh, kinds of wisdom, and they were not mainstream thinkers, uh, but they were sort of a, a minority that has been held up subsequently as as leading lights. And uh, as we look at the processes of, of modernization, such as the Industrial Revolution. Um, these are processes that were founded by these new scientific ways of, of innovation. That they were able to create machines and processes, uh, and capitalistic theories of, of how the world should work, ideologies focused completely on the individual uh, rather than the collective, um, and, and, uh, and much exploitation happened, and many people suffered greatly in ways that they might not have before um, on account of the Industrial Revolution and this new way of thinking. Uh, so is this good? Was that good? Was that a, a positive change? Maybe. Maybe not. Um, it really depends on one's perspective. And did this new rationality that said that religion had caused all the problems of the world, that out of the wars of religion came the worst human suffering ever, and if we just get rid of the church and all these differing theological uh, problems, that we can end suffering and we can stop the conflicts of the world. Well, was that successful? No. Uh, actually, the, the uh, worst... Two conflicts in the terms of, of human life and uh, the the encompassing the entirety of the globalized world happened at the height of secularization, at the height of these new uh, philosophical ways of thinking, uh, when they were implemented in the at the dawn of the 20th century in World War One, and then just a little bit later in World War Two. That these two conflicts, uh, more than 150 million lives, and that's a pretty conservative estimate, uh, were lost. Uh, the vast majority of the Western world in Europe was wiped out, destroyed, um, and, and uh, countless ecological disasters were perpetrated on the world. Um, and this was, again, at the sort of the fore of, of, the, of the wave of secularization. So this really brings into question um, whether whether that there is this theory of progress, whether we ha are able to progress with our knowledge, because it has not brought an end to the suffering and conflict. Uh, uh, poverty uh, continues to be a major problem. Um, there continues within society to be religious devotions. Um, if if in in in. Uh, 
the church has declined, but we have seen uh, the, the growth of new uh, religious movements, uh, not only in the West, but certainly everywhere else where the church does not continue to decline. It actually has grown exponentially, such as in Africa. Um, so what has the Enlightenment and globalization brought to Africa? Well, it's brought a, a uh, in the, just in, for instance, in the United Methodist Church, it has seen a 200% increase in its membership uh, in uh the years from 1970 to 2020. So it has not brought um, um, the end of religion or secularization. It has actually brought the opposite. S uh, similar things can be said for Asia and Korea, for example. Uh, but uh, this is also a very Western-centric way of, of looking at things. Um, this is really privileging Western knowledge, uh, and this is to only look at Christianity, but uh, it doesn't look at other types of religious thinking or spirituality, such as, such as Buddhism or, uh, or, or uh, sort of individualistic religions, uh, such as Wicca, uh, or these kinds of movements that have actually seen quite uh, uh, large expansions over the course of the last century. So um, I would caution you when you before embracing the secularization thesis or the, the progress, the sort of uh, modernization thesis, uh, to, to really step back and, and question these, these, uh, these things. So um, we have covered a large swath of very dense philosophical ground on this, and I appreciate you staying with us uh, through this. And... Uh, until next time, I encourage you to stay healthy, wealthy, and wise and ponder on these thoughts. Thanks for watching, everyone.